walked over and I stood by Scott and his mic just went a little bit more toward him and the way he me. Was that not true? Okay. My wife sometimes will sing next to me and she'll, she'll do this. And I'm thinking, okay, why is that? So, anyway, um, I was on an airplane. I'm not going to share the whole story because uh, uh, I'm hoping the lady uh, who was uh, watching uh, is going to be watching this uh, on the internet. Uh, and I just want to thank you to Linda, who uh, I met on the airplane in the time that we were able to share and some things in her life. Uh, and so I would also just uh, encourage you to always look for those special, special cues, those moments in which God sends someone uh, in your way, maybe to bless you, or maybe to bless each other, or that you can share something with them because of your faith. And so I'm going to ask you to write that name down somewhere, put it in your mind, Linda. God knows uh, what's going on in her life, and if you would just pray for her, then that would be awesome. Uh, there was a man in Arizona, he was in his 80s, and he called his son in California, and uh, he said, son, I've got something to tell you, I hate to tell you this, it was on a November day, and he said, I hate to tell you this, but there's trouble in the house, and your mother and I have reached the stage, even though we've been together 60 something years, we can't stand each other, and we're going to divorce. And I just wanted to tell you so that it wouldn't be a shock to you or your sister whenever I was gone. And the father hung up the phone. The son jumped on the phone to his older sister who was in Oregon. And he told her about the news. She said, don't do anything. She says, let me call dad and talk to him, see what's going on. She called the father and she got him on the phone and she said, listen, don't do anything. Promise me and my brother and I will be there Wednesday night. So the old fellow hung up the phone, turned around and hollered to his wife, all right, they're coming for Thanksgiving, now what are we going to tell them for Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> that was warped, wasn't it? Should I not told that? I read that, I thought, I've got to share that with you. Uh, we love Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is that special time when we feel like, we, uh, last week, matter of fact, we started it two weeks ago, I started a two-lesson series on uh, Jesus' story about grapes and cultivation and how that applies to us as Christians. And we all love Thanksgiving. It's usually the time the families cluster together and uh, if there's ever a feeling of joyful grapes on the vine, it, it seems to be Thanksgiving when it comes to our own immediate family. Now, the scripture that we looked at last week was in John, or two weeks ago, sorry, John chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. What we're going to look at today is the same chapter, but we're going to look at verses 7 through 14. And I decided this week, even the last time we spoke, we looked at the New International Version. Today we're going to look at the King James Version. I'm going to ask you to stand so that we can read God's Word together. If you would please stand and just kind of place that a little more holy today of what we do. If you abide in me, my words abide in you, you shall ask in what you will, and it shall be done unto you. And herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Will you please be seated. You know, there's something very special about reading God's Word. And uh, there's times at home or in my office that I read it. And sometimes I'm just going through and I'll open the Bible and I go through like a reference book or a history book. And, and then there's other times that I stop and I make myself either pray before I get into the Word, pray in the middle of the Word, uh, just something that I do that makes that time a very special time. We talked about grapes two weeks ago. We know that in order to have a maximum yield, the grape vines need lots of sunlight, the right amount of rain, 
and lots of pruning at the right amount of time. Now, we studied a couple of weeks ago that you and I were the branches and we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that we need to be continually tied to Jesus, the vine, and be disciplined or pruned by God, the vine dresser. And we found out at that time that the sap that runs through the vine is actually the power of the Holy Spirit as it runs through the branches. We studied about the importance of remaining on the vine and branches, staying close to Jesus. Now I want to start this study by saying, if you're going through a period right now of fruitlessness in your life, it's probably because sin has broken your relationship with God somewhere in that vine. And it's really important. And we need to realize that if it's blocking the Spirit's flow, we need to realize God loves us and He wants us to have an abundant life. He wants us to have a purpose-filled life and a joyful life. And if you're being disciplined, God will continue to discipline you. He will continue to discipline me until we come to that point that we repent and we confess, we acknowledge the sin, and we open up our lives for Him to work through us. When you repent, God will lift you up, clean you off, put you right back in the sunlight of His grace. Now, at the same time, if some evidence of spiritual fruit is seen in our lives, it's important to know that God will look at that and He says that He will prune us still so that more things can be fruitful in our lives. And so it's very important that we come to this place uh, that we trust God. And then we say, okay, Lord, if you are disciplining me, I need to be open to understand what that disciplining is. And if you're pruning me, I need to be open for you to take away whatever we need uh, to be taken away. It's God's desire that we trust Him more, trust in ourselves less, and allow everything to circle around our faith and our knowledge of Jesus. Now, because disciplining and pruning are so close, I thought maybe I could bring up a couple of things that would help us, maybe if we're trying to figure out what he's doing, really quickly. The first one is if you're wondering which is going on, acknowledge that God is trying to get your attention. Number one, let him know that you recognize it. Number two, trust that God wants you to know the difference between pruning and between discipline. Number three, ask God, is there a major sin in my life that I don't know about and help me to see what that sin is? Number four, pray, Lord, if you don't reveal any reason for discipline, I'm going to assume that you're pruning for growth. And number five, if you can't conclude you're being, if, excuse me, if you can't conclude you're being disciplined, repent. And if you conclude that you're being pruned, come to the point that you just release whatever it is, anything in your life. And you say, Lord, I don't understand maybe at this point. I believe it's pruning. Just show me what you want me to do. Show me what you don't want me to do, and I'll follow you. Now, Jesus says, and we're going to get into the main part of our lesson here. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and that they may have it to the full. Jesus came so you would have purpose. I've got to share just a little bit about the plane ride that I had. Uh, the lady that I was talking to, Linda, a marvelous lady who had gone through some very tough times. She told me that her husband had died when he was 60 years old. He went to bed one night and he didn't wake up the next day. And the reason uh, she believes is because he was so heart sick because of some decisions that he had made with their finances uh, that would have been good decisions, but because of the economy and what happened, uh, they lost everything. Uh, and her point to me was, I don't know if I feel any purpose any longer. Jesus says, I came to give you purpose. I came to give you life and that you would have it abundant. So what is the secret of abundant fruit bearing? Now, in John chapter 15, it's very interesting, I think, that Jesus brings out eight times, remain in me, abide in me. Now, to abide means to continue to dwell, to remain in close fellowship. And so what we find is abiding in Christ is not ritual, it's relational. It's developing this 
very deep relationship with God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit of God. It's dwelling within him. Now, this understanding of dwelling in God is not new. As a matter of fact, if you go back to the Old Testament, God's people understood what it meant. If you go back to Psalms 91, it says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So the answer, the question is, how do we remain in the shelter of the Almighty? And we have the word abide. Now, when I was younger, I used to preach a lot of acronym sermons. This lesson screams acronym. As a matter of fact, as you go through the verses that we just read a moment ago, what you're going to find is it just almost spells out the word abide by the thoughts that are there. So I try to put that a little bit together and let's see how it goes. When you think of the word abide, always think of always read and meditate on God's word. Verse 7, the first part says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Not only is it important that I get into God's word, God's word has to get into me. In Psalms 119, 105, it says, Lord, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. You know, I think I shared this with you before. I remember when I was a young boy and my great uncle would come and pick me up and we would go coon hunting. And uh, for some of you that you have, you have thoughts of Beverly Hillbilly somewhere back in Tennessee or wherever they were, uh, it was the most special night for me when I would hear that old truck coming down that lane and those dogs barking. And uh, I knew he was coming to pick me up and I would go and, and I would haul hay for 12 cents a bale and uh, make $12 a day. And, uh, and yet when you would go coon hunting and sell uh, the fur, you got $12. So which would you rather do? Uh, and besides, it was great company. And we had this old carbide light uh, that you would put on your hat. And uh, if you know much about carbide, you put water in the top, carbides in the bottom. As the water drips down to the carbide, it makes a gas. The gas comes out the front, there's a reflector, and that's a flame. But you, you can't see real well with it. And so usually you have a brighter light to be able to shine up in the trees later. But for your walking, that's just that old carbide light. And I remember walking and I said, Uncle Fawn, this light isn't, this light isn't very bright, is it? And he said, Steve, it shines as far as I can step. And I always thought of that, it shines as far as I can step. And God's light is a lamp into my way, into my feet, into my path, and it lights it up. As far as I can step, God's word will continue to lead us. Every day, we spend time meditating, reading God's Word, seeking to apply it in every situation that we find ourselves in. In Timothy, he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the Word of Truth. I, want, I just want to add one little thing. I, I was debating whether to do this. Find special times in your reading. Uh, special ways to bring the word out in your life. One of the things that I found is if if I look for a certain word, a certain uh, a passage that seems to really jump out at me, I write it down. And then during the day, I'll, I'll, I'll look back at that and I'll think, okay, this word some way applies into my life. How, how is it going to apply today? How is it going to apply tomorrow? And the next day you find another word. Write that word down. How does that apply or that thought? How does that apply in my life today? But let's jump on to number B. Out of abide. Bow before the Lord daily in prayer and worship. But the second part of verse 7 and 8 says, And you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. And by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples. Do you recognize here, even the asking of what you desire is directly tied into glorifying God. This is not the idea of making God your personal genie in which you give a list of things that you want and he just lays those things out. This is directly tied in with the idea of glorifying God with your thoughts, with your desire, and with your mind. It's lining up our heart with his heart and so that the things that we desire are the things that will glorify him. The next word is I. Imitate his love. Verses 9 and 12 says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. No longer do 
I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you my friends, for all the things that I've heard from my father, I have made known to you. Do you see what this idea is? This idea is the, the person who says to their child, listen, don't ask me, just do it. It's not for you to ask, just do what I tell you. I don't have time to explain to you why, just do it. And Jesus is saying, no, I've got the time to explain. I'm not a cruel taskmaster, he says. He says, what I am is a friend, and everything I ask you to do, there's a reason, there's a purpose, and I'll explain it to you because I'm your friend. It's allowing the love that we experience in those quiet times because of this relationship with Jesus to overflow into the relationship with other people. But how does Jesus love us? Well, he loves us warmly, passionately, fully, sacrificially, and then Jesus says, as I have loved you, then so you love one another. Let's jump to the next one, D. Whenever you see that word abide, always look at that D and think of, do what he says. Verses 10 and 14, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You are my friends, if. You are my friends, if. You do whatever I have commanded you. You know, listening for the voice of God is a wonderful thing. But if you listen to the voice of God, you listen for the voice of God, but you don't do what he asks, it really means very little. We attempt to walk with Christ and we make every effort over and over and over. Paul says, make every effort to live a certain way. Make every effort to share the word with others. Make every effort to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we not told in Romans 8 that we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son? Make every effort. And when we make every effort to do what he says do, and we make every effort to not do what he says don't do, and when we mess up, we understand that we ask for his forgiveness and it covers us, we just realize that we're walking with Christ. When your goal in life is to put him first, to do what he says, to imitate him, to follow him as your commander in chief, then you realize that you're walking in the grace of God. Not, be not because you did it perfectly, but because that's your desire. It's the desire of your heart. Let's go to E. Last word in the Bible. Our last letter. And that is ever praise him. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain, may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Every time I read this in John, I'm going to read it again. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. You know where he talks of your joy being full, John, again? In 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. He says, I'm going to tell you these things so you'll be full of joy. And then immediately tells us how that we sin. How that we fall short. How that our hearts need to be right to follow Jesus, but we are going to fall short. But our joy needs to be full because we're covered by the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. If you're really close to someone, you just look for the good in them. I was in Arkansas this last week. And I was watching my sister as she spoke about her children. You know Don. He was a youth minister for quite some while. Don was there. Matter of fact, I've got a great recording of Don snoring if anybody wants to hear it later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've got time. I'm going to share real quick. This was just the funniest thing. Then I'll go into what I was going to say. Don came and decided he wanted to sleep in a tent. Now, it was cold, so I, I don't get it. I'm in the house, he's outside the house, and I'm hearing something sounds like a dog that's dying. I'm, I'm, I'm laying there thinking, what is that? It's 3 o'clock in the morning, and I wake up, and I recognize, I, I recognize this Don who is out there, and he's sleeping, and he's snoring. And I'm thinking he's waking the whole neighborhood up. I dress, it's cold, I go outside, and I hold my recorder by the tent, because I'm thinking nobody's going to believe me. So I'm tape recording it. I go back inside, get a dress, get in bed. I turn it on, it didn't work. I get dressed, I go back outside in the cold, <laughs> and I'm recording it. Anyway, it was just really funny because I knew he would never believe me if I didn't, I didn't share that with him. 
But later, after we went back to Arkansas, we're all, there's all these kids, and there was something like 14 kids, I forgot how many adults that were all at this restaurant that they hope we will never come back again, I'm sure. Um, I start sharing this with my sister. And we're all laughing, and I've got the recorder, and I'm, I'm letting everybody hear this recorder, and, and Don's laughing. But as I started talking to my sister, everything she said about her son or her daughter was just praise and praise and praise and praise. And it wasn't, it wasn't my kids are better than your kids. She was just proud of her kids. And she looked to the good in her kids. And she encouraged her kids. And I just thought of this, if you're really close to someone, you look for the good in them and you praise them and you magnify them. And when our hearts are overflowing in joy with a relationship with Jesus, you just can't help but to share that. My sister just couldn't help but to share her feelings. You overflow with these feelings of the Lord wherever you are. If you're on a plane, if you're on a bus, if you're on a boat, if you're, doesn't matter. You can't wait to share it. And when our hearts are full of joy, we can't help but spill out. And I'd like to add, this is why we sing early in the morning before we preach and before we have the Lord's Supper. It, it, it's not to fill in that time. It's not to warm us up. It's because the Bible said in Psalms 23 and verse 3 that God inhabits the praise of His people. So Andy did a marvelous job. Scott does a marvelous job. It, you know, that we come together and we sing praise to God so God will inhabit the praise of His people. And without the presence of God, there's no reason to preach. There's no reason to do anything else. I'm going to give you some final thoughts. This is Thanksgiving week. This is the time we get together and whatever your heritage does for you, if it puts a little piece of, of, a, of a, a kernel of corn on a plate and say what you're, bled, what you're thankful for, or if you just sit around in your room doing that, whatever, whatever it is that you do on this Thanksgiving week, can I encourage you to praise God foremost. Think of what He's done for us. Think of what He's done to us. Uh, think of who He is. Our part is passionately, wholeheartedly seeking the presence of God in His Word and prayer, love, obedience, and praise. But what's Jesus' part? His part is to be there. Jesus' part is He says, I'm there and I'm with you and I walk with you and I talk with you and I, I encourage you and I send the Spirit. He says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. James 4 and verse 8. And then verse 4. The next one. Abide in me, and I in you, and as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides on the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. Two closing observations. Number one, fruit is not meant to be admired. It's meant to be consumed. And the purpose of fruit bearing is not for our own benefit, it's for the benefit of the lives of other people. So we let our love and our peace and our joy and all those things of the fruit of the Spirit to reach other people. It's through our likeness in Christ that they are drawn to Christ. And so we say with David, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And blessed is the one who trusts in Him. And the final thought is fruit brings glory to the gardener. Not to the fruit. And if you see that God is, is, is pruning you, and He's molding you, and He's changing you, you never lift yourself up, you never brag about that. You realize that you don't take credit for Christ-like qualities that are being cultivated in your life by the gardener. I'd like to end with these two verses. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you'll be my disciples. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. You may be struggling with something in your life today. Can I tell you that God cares? You may be struggling with something that you've not shared with anybody. Maybe it's something you don't, you're afraid to come forward. You're saying, I'm broken, now you want me to come forward. You don't have to share all of it. If you want to come up and just let us put our arms around you and tell you that we care and that God cares and we pray for you and that the power comes through the vine into the branches and that the power is the Holy Spirit. We would love to do that. If you're not a Christian, the baptistry is ready. We would love to baptize you into Christ.
Whatever you need, this is the time to come when we stand and sing.